Right, so this screencast is all about thermodynamics. I'm currently coming to you from a laptop that's been literally held together with gaffer tape, but we'll see if it holds up. Uh, what we're going to cover today, um, how to relate kinetics and thermodynamics. So we did a little bit of this in the lectures, so this is going to recap most of that and kind of show the, um, <clears throat> the derivation again uh, for how to link various things together. So I'm just going to recap what's the difference between kinetics and thermodynamics, uh, what are those involved, uh, and then connecting them together. So activation energy to delta H, uh, and then oh, I haven't put it onto the slide, but we're going to do the Arrhenius factor to delta S. I've given you the summary of that, uh, but I didn't go through it in details. And then extend to something called transition state theory. So that's going to be at the end. <clears throat> it's technically outside the scope of the course, but it should set the groundwork for what you will do later on involved in physical chemistry. So now equilibrium versus kinetics. What's the difference between the big K and the little k? So hopefully this is going to be a revision, but at least sets the scene for what we're going to be talking about uh, later. Uh, so what you should be aware of uh, is the difference between diamond and graphite. Um, what you might not know, you may know, uh, is that diamond is actually a higher energy structure than graphite uh, by a considerable amount. 1.9 kilojoules per mole is the delta H value between them. <coughs> if I remember up rightly, uh, it's in kilojoules per mole. Uh, <coughs> sorry, it's delta G value is somewhere in the region of about 3 kilojoules per mole. So. Obviously, one is going to be more stable than the other, and if this was just a chemical equilibrium, we could plug this into various equations to get us our rate constant. So if we start with 3 kilojoules per mole, we want to insert that here, rearrange to get K, so this E to an energy over RT type function is what all of physical chemistry seems to revolve around, this sort of function, and we can evaluate that to get 0.2979. Now we can then rearrange that, and if this was a chemical equilibri equilibrium, we would expect 77% graphite, 23% diamond. <clears throat> Evidently that doesn't happen. Uh, diamonds are pretty much solid. Um, they don't react. Why isn't that the case? Um, for instance, so this is why we deal with kinetics. Uh, so what you will find is actually the activation energy to go from diamond to graphite, or vice versa, is somewhere in the region of 540 kilojoules per mole, at least the figure that I can find out. So that's the, at least the activation enthalpy-ish. Uh, this is reaction. Uh, so those are two energy values that these would have to overcome in order to, uh, to interconvert. So as a result, one might be thermodynamically stable, but it can't transfer there. The kinetic energy value is way too high. Uh, so this cannot happen fast enough. And we'll uh, go on to quantifying how not very quick uh, in a moment. Um, just as what should be worth um, watching, if I remember to put a link to this, uh, is that you can actually get diamond to overcome reaction barriers if you set it on fire. Uh, this is a screenshot from the 2012 um, Christmas lectures where they set a diamond on fire in, in concentrated oxygen. So yes, they are reactive, you can get them to react, but you do need quite a bit of energy to get over that activation barrier. Um, it's thermodynamically unstable, but it's so kinetically inert, it takes a lot of energy to actually get it over an activation barrier and to react. Um, one kind of um, analogy for this that I've uh, found that's actually quite interesting, so if you're interested in uh, teaching and later later on this might be something that's useful. Uh, the idea of knocking something over. If you actually had a box up on end like this, um, <coughs> obviously it's more stable if it is lying down like that. The trouble is in order to tip it over, that centre of gravity, the centre of mass has to go up. So it's almost like this is your starting material, that's the end, but it won't just spontaneously tumble over, you've got to get it over some kind of activation barrier. So if you want to knock something over, you've actually got to do the equivalent of picking it up by that kind of distance. So you can actually work out how much energy that takes. Um, 
if you're really, really interested, you can um, figure out how much it is to tip a cow over, and that's why cow tipping is an urban myth. Uh, but anyway, activation energy to enthalpy, this is the important thing that you probably need to be aware of. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is just throw the answer at you immediately. What we're finding is that delta H here, the difference between our reactant and product in terms of their internal energy, that enthalpy, uh, is equal of the difference between the activation energies. So there are two reactions. One goes forward, it has this activation energy. One goes backwards, it has this activation energy. The difference between them is then delta H of the reaction. So how are we going to deal with this? Uh, well, let's start with the very basics. An irreversible reaction, our rate is equal to the rate of change of the product, uh, the reactants, the rate of change of the products, and that can be controlled by a rate law of kA by dt is equal to negative kA. That's our starting point for any kind of kinetics. But in equilibrium, things are a little bit different. Our def definition of the rate is exactly the same. The rate of reaction will go at a particular speed, uh, and A will convert to B at the same rate. Uh, but they're controlled by two reactions this time. So A will grow by whatever this reaction is, but it will decrease by whatever that reaction is. So it will be consumed by one reaction and reformed by another. So at this point, we can say the rate of change is equal to that plus this, uh, or we can reverse it. We say dB by dt is equal to positive of K1 because B grows by that reaction minus k negative 1 times b, because of that is now decreasing in concentration. Uh, so remember, these are just one set of ways of denoting different rate constants. I use 1 and minus 1 for a forward and backwards reaction. You can actually get k and some more right, right forward and k backward. You might even see k a b, k b a, or someone might be really going to manage to do K1 and K2. Uh, they are all the same, as long as you're kind of consistent and you're happy that you know which is referring to what, you can use any numbering scheme or labeling scheme you like. So, at equilibrium, you should know as chemists, the reaction is not changing. There's not a change in concentration. Now, microscopically, yes, a molecule might be converting from one to the other, but macroscopically in the lab we can't measure a concentration change. So these must add up to zero. The rate of change of A and the rate of change of B is both zero. That means these must add or subtract to cancel each other out, and that leads to this conclusion. K1A is equal to K minus 1B. So this is one of those approximations we can start using to get information from it. So we assume everything's at equilibrium, these rates are now the same. And we can then rearrange this. <coughs> um, <coughs> rearrange this equation, we bring that over to this side, this over to that side, and what we get is a ratio of our concentrations equals a ratio of rate constants. Now you should also be aware from thermodynamics that a ratio of concentrations is equal to an equilibrium constant. And this is the exact same equilibrium constant that appears in this delta G equation here. This is one of the core equations of physical chemistry. This is one of the ones that you should be able to rattle off uh, pretty much instantaneously. If I say delta G equals to, you should say that it's um, all the delta H minus T delta S minus both are the same. Both are quite equally important. So that gives us a hint of what we're going to do next to this equation. We've got k here. We want to get it into log form. So we can do this k to log k. We've now got it equal to that part. Uh, and if we take a log of our rate constants, then the log rules say that they become subtractive. So log of k divided by k minus 1 becomes this. So that's just logarithmic rules, it's a little bit of mathematical rearrangement, but this is another equation that gives us k. 
And so previously we start with the ratio of great constants is equal to k. Here the difference in the logs of them is equal to log k. It's just a mathematical transformation uh, that becomes very, very useful to us. All right, so after that, uh, this is a bit of an obscure step. You might not necessarily think about it, but we're going to differentiate it with respect to temperature. Um, check the delta G equation for a moment. Uh, T is in there, so delta G is a function of the rate con uh, the equilibrium constant and temperature. Uh, so it's not entirely out of nowhere, but you might not necessarily think to do this at this stage. So we've just differentiated it with respect to T. That gives us this equation and we will start substituting in these different components so this is one to remember we're going to take this and figure out what does this mean and substitute it and what does that mean and substitute it so let's start with this one let's have some reason blanked out but if we start with delta g minus rt log k rearrange it bring that onto this side and then we substitute delta g for delta H minus T delta S. So we could, in fact, swap this entire factor here for this one. And then it's just a case of breaking it up into two components, delta H over RT and T delta S over RT. And then, well, we've got negative here, so we need to reverse this. So we've got that there and this. So this is the sort of manipulation that you need to get used to doing as well. If we have a delta G um, function at some point, you should be able to substitute in delta H in delta S. Uh, and vice versa as well, if we have a delta H equals something, uh, you should be able to break it up into delta G and delta S again. This could be really useful, especially in some tutorial questions or some quite complicated ones. Right, from here, we just start cancelling things down. There's a T and a delta S there. The, the T delta S um, cancels out here. Uh, leaves us with a much more simplified version here. And then we're going to differentiate with respect to temperature, because previously we differentiated log K with respect to temperature. We've got log K on this side. It makes sense that we want to do this to both sides. So here's my D by DT. That's an operator. And we apply that to both sides of an equation in order for this to work. So we want to differentiate that with respect to uh, t and that with respect to t. Okay, so how does this actually work? Well, this, well, we can just leave this as is. This we can actually do something with. Uh, we can actually evaluate that function quite nicely. Uh, so we want to differentiate this with respect to t. What you'll find is that is the equivalent of t to the power of zero. So, well, we'll multiply that by zero, it cancels out. Uh, this one, I'll draw it up over here, that's equal to delta H over R T to the minus 1. So what we do is differentiate that as before. We want that to be T to the minus 2, then we times that by minus 1. Uh, so that becomes minus delta H over R. And that is what we insert over here. So what we find is d log k by dt is equal to delta h over rt squared. Uh, so that's, you're still not quite comfortable with it, that's what these minus twos are equal to. That's what that's defined as. Right. <clears throat> so from that, we've gone from delta t, uh, delta g equals minus rt log k to of that expression. Okay, so we're going to leave that one there. Now go back to our <coughs> um, actual rates again. And we're going to look at the Arrhenius equation. So that's F. what is the rate constant equal to? So the rate constant is a function of two things. One is temperature, one is an activation energy. And we also have that pre-exponential factor that we're not as interested in at the moment. Uh, but it is also a component. Uh, and by extension, that also applies to an equilibrium. We have a rate going forward and a rate coming back. We have exactly the same equation on both sides. Uh, difference being, I've just labeled them differently. So a forward reaction and a backwards reaction will have a different uh, pre-exponential factor. 
it will also have a different activation energy. So go back to that very first diagram I showed. There are two different activation energies going forward and backwards. So we've got two rate constants related to two activation energies. Great. Now we can take logs of that as well, because this gets the equation at least linear, but remember previously we had some logs in the previous equation. So we take a log of that, our a comes down to here, and when we times something by to the uh, activation energy of our RT, that part comes down. Okay. So that's again, happens for both ways, forwards and backwards. And now we can go back to this sort of equation. And what you can see is this was kind of what we were, we got a little bit earlier and we could, if we wanted to substitute those in, although we're not going to right now, we're going to do something a bit different, uh, which is differentiate it with respect to temperature. Ooh. There we go. So what do, I, how do we differentiate this with respect to temperature? There's our DUI DT operator. Uh, well, we can just leave these as is uh, for now. Uh, and what's that going to be? That's t to the minus 1. Just as before, that's going to go to t to the minus 2. Uh, at least negatively. This becomes 0 because there's no t in it. Uh, this comes down to here. We the exact same rules as before. And we do that twice to get this and that function out of it. So what we've got is two functions from our Arrhenius expression. One function that we did when we were trying to rearrange this expression and differentiate it by t. And look, we had this one earlier as well. And now we're going to just substitute those in. And what do we get from it? We get this here. There we go. So we've substituted those all in. We've converted this to here. We've converted each of these log k values into these activation energy terms. And what you should notice is these are t squared all cancel. And we end up with this rather boring looking equation that looks exactly the same as what our intuition said. The difference in activation energies is equal to the reaction enthalpy. Great. It is really nice when the maths actually works out. So there's our activation energies. Is the delta H the difference between them? Uh, the activation energies is delta H. Fabulous. Uh, so, all that long convoluted maths does prove something that you might be able to show with a diagram, uh, but it's actually kind of the other way around. The diagram comes from this set of calculations. Just the diagram is really easy for you to understand, so you usually get that presented first. So, anyway, now the pre exponential factor to entropy. I've given you this in the lecture notes, but in a kind of condensed form. So we'll go through it now, kind of step by step. Uh, so just in case you're a bit lost with it, we're starting with this. As before, we start with the Arrhenius equation and we linearize it because we're interested in logs. And we also want that relationship that we had before. So, you know, previously I said we could just substitute these straight in without doing any um, deriving with respect to temperature here. So let's go ahead and do that. Each of these k's are equal to that. So we can substitute in for all of this here. Let's erase that because that looks a bit ugly. Okay, so we've done one, we've done another. Uh, and there we go. This is just some rearrangement now. So we'll remove the brackets out first because, uh, well, that just helps you show that we've got two values there. And then rearranging. So I want to collect these terms on one side and these terms on one side. So now we've got something that looks at least a little tidier. Uh, you can see, for instance, that has over RT in common. So that can be rewritten as this, for instance, uh, which is usually useful for us. Uh, so let's have a look. What we want to do is then do that, but also pay attention to these log rules. Okay, so we are subtracting two logs. That's equivalent of doing dividing the numbers. It's just one of these rules you need to get used to in order to make clear the numbers. 
So actually the log of the ratio of these pre exponential factors here is what that simplifies to. We can also take that 1 over RT out. So we're collecting these together as well. Now that section there, once we cancel out those negatives and so on, looks very similar to what we had previously. That is what was equal to delta H. So what we can actually then do is begin substituting that in. So we have delta H here. But you also can notice that this section now looks very similar to that previous equation. So we've had this one, we rearranged it, uh, and then we can substitute delta G for delta H and delta S. Uh, cancel out the T's, obviously. We want to cancel those ones out. Uh, but that's not entirely a formal proof. We can't just say one equation looks very similar. So what we need to do is just substitute that log K for the delta S and delta H. So we want to take this and we want to shove it in the place of that. So that's what we've got down here. So we've just rearranged them. Uh, and now we're going to replace that with the delta H. And what you find is Here's the delta H over RT, here's delta H over RT, they're going to cancel and we end up with delta S equals log of the ratio of these pre-exponential factors. Uh, so once again, a little bit of convoluted mathematics, uh, but it's there. Hopefully you can follow it, uh, if not the... Um, well. So that's a slightly less uh, intuitive result than this one is. Oops, there we go. So just to review the two things we're looking at, delta H, this is our intuitive result. It's the difference to the act between the activation energies. This is the less intuitive result, uh, less needed for an exam, certainly. Delta S over R is equal to a log of these two factors. So we could get delta S out of um, our Arrhenius data if we do the right kinetics together. In reality, you probably use something like the I-ring equation to get delta S and delta H out of this um, because getting forward and backwards equilibria uh, data is a little bit more difficult in reality. But still, uh, that is the main relationship you need to know, so all of that's previous derivation. Anyway, now this is Transition states. So this is, I don't want to spend too long on it. Um, it just lay the groundwork for something you might come across a bit later called transition state theory. So this is how we relate kinetics to thermodynamics. A little bit more qualitatively. I don't want to put too many um, huge derivations into it. Um, so this is what we're looking at here. We've got our activation energy and our reaction profile. So one can go from reactant to product. Delta H separating them that controls the equilibrium. So these tell us what K is equal to, the small K. That tells us what the forward reaction is. This tells us big K, the equilibrium, and so on. And we could also, in principle, swap these all out for delta G. And if it's delta G, we can get the equilibrium constant out of it. And what we're interested in, actually, this transition state here, because we're going to set up an equilibrium between the reactant, not the product, but whatever is up here. Because a transition state is still a chemical, it will still be a physical entity and it will have energy associated with it. So if a reactant has to convert to a certain form that's really stretched and strained and high energy, it's got to take that energy in and then it will relax back down to the product. Uh, now the interesting part about this is that once a molecule hits this transition state, uh, that's level. It can actually, in fact, it has a 50% probability of going that way, and a 50% probability, if my pen works, of going that way. So that's the only little caveat you need to know. We get it up to a transition state, wobbles a little bit. Is it going to fall down back to the reactant, or is it going to fall down towards the product? It's a 50-50 chance. So what we're going to do next is set up a equilibrium between that and the transition state. Because if we know the energy difference between this one up here, the transition state, and the ground state of the reactant, 
we know how many molecules in theory have enough energy to get up to here. Uh, not too dissimilar to the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution and the Bax and the Boltzmann factor and all of that, but this is a slightly more rigorous way when we get into the maths of it. So let's look at <coughs> the diamond example again. That activation energy is about 540 kilojoules per mole, uh, and I'm just going to assume delta G is roughly about that. Um, it is not going to make as much of a difference as you might think. So if delta G is roughly that, we can actually work out what K is. What is the equilibrium constant between, say, diamond and its transition state towards graphite? Well, you can actually plug that into the equation, and you get 10 to the minus 88. That is a hugely small equilibrium constant. That tells you everything that is going to, uh, everything you need to know about the speed of the reaction. Everything is going to be on this side of the equilibrium between diamond and the transition state. So we've got diamond on one side, transition state on the other. The equilibrium very, very much lies in that direction. So do the maths about one in 10 to 38 atoms. Almost to the point where it doesn't really matter what the exact numbers are, that is huge. Uh, and to put it in perspective, this is the estimate for how many atoms are in the entire universe. So if 1 in 10 to the 88 diamond atoms are going to be, uh, carbon atoms in diamond, are going to be at its transition state, then if the entire universe was made of diamond, you still wouldn't find one. That's quite an impressive um stability there. So this is not going to climb over that activation energy barrier spontaneously at all. Uh, certainly not at room temperature. You have to really pump it up to tens of thousands of degrees to make it spontaneously change to graphite. So that is why, even though it is quite highly, quite, quite significantly less stable, uh, less stable than graphite, it won't convert spontaneously. No way can these atoms get to that transition state at least to a first approximation with transition state theory. But let's try it with a slightly different delta G. So imagine we have a delta G of activation of 100 kilojoules per mole. So our activation energy here, the difference between the ground state, that reactant, and our transition state is 100 kilojoules per mole in delta G. We can then plug that back into our equation. <coughs> find out what is k we rearrange that and that ends up with 1.17 times 10 to the minus 14 at 375 again that sounds really low but that's a mole of materials is on the scale of one uh, times 10 to the 23 so actually a quite an appreciable number if it's 1 10 to the 14 of these will in fact react so at any one point in time something with just an activation energy of this quite a number should be capable of reacting. So that's roughly how the transition state theory begins to work. We try to figure out <clears throat> how many molecules can reach the transition state, what is the equilibrium constant, and can we convert that into rate data. So when you get into transition state theory properly, this is what you're going to be end up doing in a little bit more rigor. Uh, there are a few other caveats that we don't really have time to cover right now. Uh, but this is setting the scene for what we're going to be doing. Climbing to a transition state and dropping down. And let's just review it again. So, equilibria. So, states are separated by energy. So, the higher energy states are less populated. This is true of all chemistry. Um, you're after something with low energy because more things will fill that state. So, you can do the same with transition state. There's an equilibrium between the reactant and its transition state, but that energy is a lot higher. So whereas with a normal delta G of you know, only a couple of kilojoules per mole or something like that, you might be expecting a, you know, a equilibrium constant that you can measure. So if you go here, you're going to be talking about 10 to the 1 in 10 to the 14 molecules. Only a few molecules at any one time are going to have the right energy. Uh, so therefore, we can kind of start working on what should affect the rate based on activation energies. <clears throat> so a more tra populated transition state or a low energy transition state means the reaction is faster. 
so it shouldn't escape your attention that that is what a catalyst does. It lowers the energy of the transition state, so it's more likely that molecules will have that energy. Things will move faster. Then a higher energy transition state will make the reaction slower. So just like we're going from diamond to carbon, the transition state, if I was to draw a half decent looking reaction profile, is absolutely staggeringly huge. We go from diamond to graphite. That looks like it's a really low energy jump, but it's got to get up to here first. And in fact, to scale, I th think if you go back to that diagram, the energy difference on the diagram will only be a couple of centimeters. The transition state is about 10 meters above you to scale on that diagram. Um, so this is huge, hundreds upon hundreds of kilojoules per mole. You're not going to see that reaction occur. So anyway, that's the basics of transition state theory. Uh, before was just covering most of the <coughs> derivations. So you don't need to learn those derivations, but you do need to be aware of how you would go about doing that kind of thing. Uh, and so that really, really, really is it for dealing with thermodynamics and kinetics.